geezer keeps seems to be getting closer and closer. He was silly, really, because he had stripes on, yellow stripes. He was an escapee, so he stood out a bit. <laughs> he keeps getting closer and closer. Then all of a sudden, I, I knew he, he was coming for me, and I see it come down out of his sleeve. He had a um, like a loo brush, you know the long loo brushes. He'd broke the end off and done it with a lighter or something and um, pointed it up. I see him, he, I said to him, that, that for me, and he went, yeah, it's for you, Fieldsy. Oh, and I'll tell you what I said. If you don't go away, I'm going to take that off you, ram it up your arse, and I'll take your teeth out to get it out. And he looked at me and he just dropped it and ran, thank <laughs> Christ. <laughs> and uh, he was a friend of Joe's. The, the governor there and he was getting some ass they was coming in from I don't know how, how they ever thought they were going to get away with it but they were going in and they wanted money so he, he phoned up and uh, he said tell them to come back on Friday me and Cornish were in there a mate of mine he's just died the governor said uh, that's them there so I said call them into the kitchen the kitchen was behind the bar so he called them through they thought he was going through to get their bit of wedge but through the door come me and Cornish and I, I had a um, Astra. It, it was a um, like a, a small automatic, and um, uh, Cornish had a meat cleaver which he picked up as he went in. And uh, <coughs> I stuck the gun in the geezer's mouth and explained the rights and wrongs of it and all that and other. <coughs> and I ejected a bullet, you know, you can just pull the slide, well, you know, back guns, pulled the slide back, the bullet came out, I caught it, I said, open your mouth, he opened his mouth, I went, now swallow, <laughs> <laughs> made him swallow it, <laughs> and Cornish was just going to chop this geezer's hand off on the on the big kitchen chopping block, but I said to him, I think we've done enough. All right, so I'm hugely honoured to have Ronnie Field with us, you know, there's not many left from this generation to tell these classic stories. Ronnie's book, Nefarious, should be out by the time you get this. Link is in the description box below the video. Check it out. Just to give you a little summary from the book, it says, prolific armed robber with close ties to the Cray family and Joey Pyle, embedded in the South London underworld for 60 years. 60 years. First prisoner in double cat A Belmarsh unit, co-defendant of Charlie Cray in the infamous police sting case that brought the last Cray brother down. So I've got a hell of a note. It's, it's a huge story and we are greatly honoured, Ron, that you've come Thank you. and told it with us today. So we're going to go over it in the order everything happened so that the viewers are on this journey with us chronologically. So what, what was it like for you? Where were you born? What was it like growing up? Uh, I was born in Epsom Workhouse, one of the last workhouses to uh, be open. I never knew that until we was uh, looking into doing the book and uh, Martin found out that's where I was born. For the young generation, can you explain what a workhouse, what that means? It's, it's a place where they stick you in, um, when you're skint, that's where you go. <laughs> when, when your mum can't feed you, I mean there was uh, seven of us at home at the time, there was 13 of us all together. Uh, some died, some went into homes, and uh, the lucky, the lucky ones sort of s stayed at home. But it weren't, it weren't that great. It was a uh, terrible upbringing, really brutal, brutal upbringing. My grand, my grand brought us all up. We all lived in the same house as her, and um, she great, took great pleasure in inflicting pain. Proper pleasure. You could see it in her face. She really enjoyed hurting people. And of course, she had us seven to her all the time she wanted. <laughs> what kind of pain was she inflicting? Because there was corporal punishment when I was a young person. It was like getting caned and the rule and things like that. Yeah, hers was a big long walking stick, a big knobbly thing about, about that thick. And she used to knock you out sometimes. And my Uncle Fred's favourite thing was, you know the, the buckles that go underneath a, a horse? That big belt that goes underneath, it's got a big buckle on it, hasn't it? Well, he used to wield that about. If it's you on the head, it'd knock your spark out. He was lucky then, really. <laughs> and what kind of infractions did they inflict these punishments on you for? No, no infractions, they just like hurting people. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Usually, usually... Um, 
there were a lot of food about and uh, we used to get the last lot of the food you know what I mean my mum uh, my brothers my sisters we was at the end of the queue Gran Uncle Fred cousin Jimmy they was at the front of the queue they got theirs and we had what was divided out amongst us what was left and just to set the scene a bit more then is this like post-war Britain is that what you're talking about or was the war no this is after the war this was after the war yeah so it, Britain was like repairing itself was it London was bombed out was it yeah well I, I didn't live in London I lived in Epsom and Cheam yeah but um yeah it, it was after the war and there weren't a lot about I suppose and uh, there was even less in our house <laughs> yeah and what was your relationships with your siblings like good good mind you I say good they, they always I had a little bit of a nutty spree once I stabbed me uh, brother and my sister um I never knew why I'd done it. It, 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 it just happened. How old were you? <laughs> oh, about uh, 12, I suppose, 13. But I, I always have a terrible, terrible temper. Really bad temper. People say they got a bad temper. No one had a temper like mine. <laughs> I had a terrible temper. And it just happened one day. Something was said and, um, a big, you know, the old uh, bread board and a big knife on it. And that was there and... Uh, I snatched it up and done them both. <laughs> no, I, I can't remember what was said. Okay. And was that something that was just handled within the family? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I went down the cellar for a couple of days. I got locked in the cellar for a couple of days, and not Because you were the youngest? I'm the youngest, yeah. Did the older ones protect you? Yeah. Especially my sisters. My sisters uh, always looked after me. Used to give me some of their food and all that, you know, without yeah. being caught. They, yeah. they got caught; they wouldn't have had nothing. So, they used to slip me a bit, and it. It's just it, it probably boggles people's minds what it was like to be raised during that period of time. And what about school? Yeah, I went to school. Yeah, I went to. Uh, we all went to the same school, year after year, sort of thing. A lot of us, they always knew us when we come. No <laughs> uniforms. <laughs> scruffy dirty smelly <laughs> yeah did you have any interests in school any what interests not really sports anything like that no no I just Nothing. wanted to make money you wanted to make money yeah so what were your first hustles hustles yeah like how were you making money early on uh just uh, milk floats of, what, what age you mean what age do you want to go back to yeah go back to your very first making money attempts it was a milk float, <laughs> silly milk float, and uh, they used to have them satchel things they used to carry, and uh, he was just walking up the path, I run by him and grabbed, probably I was just, probably a bag thief, wasn't I, really, when you think about it, it's terrible, isn't it, but I snatched his bag, <laughs> and uh, it kept us all fed for a few weeks, I know that, <laughs> and uh, we used to go down the road, and uh, there was a greengrocer's down there, down in Cheam, Cheam Village, and I used to go round the back of there and nick a sack of taters. And the, the uh, bakers were next door and the bread used to go out in the cooling ovens. And we used to take a, only take what we wanted, you know, not just to throw it away. Take, take a couple of loaves of bread and the taters and we got a plate of chips and some bread then. It sounds like it was raw survival. Yeah, it was really, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. How did your mum and dad meet? <laughs> My mum, my mum, come a very, from a very, very well-to-do family, and her parents had the pub called the um, Glen Arms on the way to Yule. My dad was coming back from the Derby on a horse and cart, <laughs> and he popped in there and met my mum, <laughs> and uh, it all started from there. <laughs> I mean, she regretted the day that happened. <laughs> oh my goodness! Why do you say that? Well, she didn't have a very good life. She had a terrible life. He was always beating her up. If he weren't beating up, my gran was. Then, then he went. He left. Uh, he was in and out. He was a safe blower. And uh, he was in and out of prison and all that, you know. And then he, he just went to prison, never come back no more. He moved out. <coughs> and uh, that's the last thing I see of him till I was about 
15 or 16 and there was a pub two doors down from us in Tune Village and my brother Billy came and he said the old man's next door in the pub I went you joke and he went no so I went next door and see him I didn't hit him and I think I should have done really <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah we had a chat he explained a few things why he'd gone and uh, that's how it all, all start that's how my start life started off really I thought he's doing all right and uh, we're all here hungry. <laughs> uh, I don't class myself as a thief. I'm not a thief. I think I think of myself as a villain. Not a thief. Well, well, I mean, if I come round your house, you could have hundreds of thousands of pounds laying about. I'd never touch it. You know, I, that is the sort of thief I am. A security van or a bank or something like that. But nothing, nothing otherwise. So what did you know about your dad safe blowing? Sorry? So, so I spoke to a guy called Charlie Seeger out of Liverpool and he was a safe blower at a very young age. Mm. So what did you learn about your father, how he was doing it and stuff no, like that? No, no, he, he learned it during the war. He, he, was, he? he was in bomb disposal. <gasps> so he learned it all there. No, I, I, he said to me, he said, uh, you know, well, he said to me one day, why, why are you robbing, you know, going in banks with a gun and it? And I said, well, I'm in there three or four minutes. There, you're, you're there all night. You know, I, I mean, I'm in and gone. Still got the same amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was home indoors. <laughs> so did he get arrested for that safe blowing? Did he go to prison? Uh, yes, I think he did, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't think he got a lot about an eight, I think, something like that. Yeah. Was he around much in your life? You said you, you know, no. he, he, was, he was pretty much absent. No, he weren't around at all, really. How did that make you feel? It was natural, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was just natural to me not to have him there. When I, my sisters really looked after me. Uh, my brothers, the uh, brothers went into homes. Billy went into home. Peter went into home. Ted went into home. The others had all died. And uh, there was just me indoors. Um, my sister Sissy, Dalla, and my sister Pat, um, cousin Jimmy, Granddad, Granny. Uncle Fred and my mum. I think there was someone else, but I can't figure who it was. <laughs> it was enough. It was only a two bedroom, two up, two down sort yeah. of. Well, three up really with the attic. Yeah. Because you, you, you talk about it so matter of factly. I've got a son, a little baby son. And to me, you know, to be separated, that, that would be something traumatic. Do you think that the separation from your dad and, you know, people dying, people getting, getting wrenched from family members? hardened you would you say well it's, it probably did but i didn't realize it at the time yeah you know i mean uh, hardship was a way of life wasn't it you know, mm. it was just the way it was you some days you was hungry some days you weren't most days i was bleeding hungry yeah <laughs> so every day you're just going out and it's that's what i used to like about fed. school school dinners because <laughs> we used to get them for nothing anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> free school dinners what was your first running with the law Oh, please, no. Um, I don't know, just, just being a teddy boy, I think. Just getting moved along on the streets and then nothing, nothing serious. I don't think. <laughs> there was, at age 14, your grandmother was assaulting your mother. Yeah. What oh, happened yeah. then? Um, I jumped on her. Um, started strangling her. Well, she was a big old salt. She was really, she was big. She's like a big old washerwoman. You, you know, like you see them when the sleeves rolled up. And, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I nearly lost that. But, <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, they, they pulled me off in the end. But she was definitely going to go if I'd have had my way. Yeah. I mean, she's always picking on mama. She used to get her, uh, that money I used to get from the council or whatever it is every week. She didn't dare spend any of it. She had to give it me grand, and me grand would give it out a little bit at a time, you know what I mean? Yeah. After a few bottles of Guinness I took out of it and things like that. <laughs> so did that put an end to her assaulting your mum? Or yeah. did it continue? Put, put it into assaulting everybody. She never touched no one else right. after that. Nor okay. my Uncle Fred, because I'd done him. I'd done my Uncle Fred and all. What was the incident with your Uncle Fred when you'd done him? Uh, he raped my sister. What? And um, I waited for him to come home one night and uh, the back door 
was underneath the bathroom window and I threw an house brick down on him. Went down and kicked the granny out of him. Good for you. Yeah. And, and he he never come back. No, he left after that, never come back. I don't think he liked me a lot. Well, he certainly had that coming. He did. So there was a point there where you run away and travel with the fur. Yeah. Was that fun? That was good. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was yeah, I enjoyed that. What were the furs like back in those days? What kind of things would you see? Uh, the same as they are today. Uh, coconut shies, uh, dodgems, swings, roundabouts, all the, all the same stuff as you got today. Because we, we, we was related to the Smiths, a uh, big travelling family. We, we, we were related to them, so I went with them instead of going to school. Yeah. <laughs> And what was your job at the fur? Just collecting the money, just take money off of people, you know. And were you staying away from crime at that point? Oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know about crime then. Yeah. yeah. Your family didn't report you missing? No. I think I the one less to feed, innit? <laughs> <laughs> when did you go to see the fortune teller? Oh, I didn't know that was in there. I didn't know I told you about that. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Smith. There, uh, she said to us. She said to me, um, it was about two o'clock one morning. We, everything was shutting down. We was counting all the money up, and uh, she was a, a proper gypsy woman. She looked looked like she should do, you know, dark skinned, um, chicken hair, everything and all that. You know what I mean? And uh, she, she cut me off a big chunk of bread, a big chunk of ham, a mug of tea. And she said, your grand said you'll come to a bad end. She said, you'll probably hang. Well, she was wrong there, wasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> so she saw bad things. Yeah. And then at 16, you had a situation with a school teacher. The school teacher it ended in a violent situation. Uh, I've done a few teachers. What was the first one then, Mister Mister Kitney? And why had he upset you? He used to he, he had the sole of a, a slipper or a, or a trainer. It was pimp sole in them days. Now to a, a length of um, broom handle by that long, so he could get a good swing at it. And he was hitting me one day, and I thought myself, I can hurt him, and I did. <laughs> I thought, well, one more standing here when I can, I know I can hurt him, so I hurt him. And uh, the school didn't like that very much. And then uh, I went on to another school, and there was a science teacher there. He was all, he weren't too bad, but he, he had that habit of throwing things at you, and, he, and you want to hear with him, you know what I mean? He, he threw a blackboard rubber at me, hit me on the back of my head, I picked it up and flung it back at him, and it hit him right in the face. <laughs> <laughs> he weren't happy about that either. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was all that squaring up to each other you know what i mean I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid at school and he's a grown man they'd all just come out of the army aren't they right all the teachers had come out of the army navy or air force you know what i mean and they were a bit handy yeah but um i had a, a vicious streak <laughs> so did, i've been told <laughs> did, did you have any goals at that any age? what any dreams any goals yeah uh, money making money money and nice clothes I always wanted nice clothes handmade shirts suits shoes yeah. Always wanted it because I see other people with it. You know what I mean? I thought I'm going to have that one day and I got it in the end. So, Who did you look up to, to that you saw was dressed like that? Uh, I mean, only, only other faces uh, I used to be about in them days. I mean, I, I didn't get no, to know Joe till I was um, 15, 16. You know, Joey Pyle. Could you explain to the viewers about Joey Pyle? Joey Pyle was... Uh, Friend of the twins, a friend of everybody. There wasn't a firm in London that he didn't have a friend in. Um, he stopped loads of people getting killed. He used to sort the trouble out, you know. Me and you had a ruck. Instead of me going to do you, you're going to do me. Joe would step in and say, look, we, we can sort this out this way or the other, you know what I mean? It, it always ended up, well, most times ended up good, you know what I mean? He was a very, known as a peacemaker, he was. But if you fell foul of him, you was in trouble. <laughs> yeah, he was really in trouble. And how did your relationship with him begin? 
I was drinking in the, um, I was young, but I was drinking in the Red Lion at Sutton. And uh, <clears throat> he kept coming in there, him and a couple of other gazers used to come in there all booted and suited and stand there talking and that. And uh, <clears throat> he used to see me in there all the time and I'd nod and he'd nod and then I sent him a drink over and he'd send me a drink over. And then one day we was just standing there talking and he said, uh, do you want to go to work? I knew what you meant. I said, yeah, I do want to go to work. I do want to go driving a bus or nothing. <laughs> I wanted to go to work and get some proper money. And uh, that's what I did. And I was with him ever since. What was the first job you collaborated with him? I can't tell you that. <laughs> All right. Is there any, any of the work that you can talk about? Well, I'll talk, talk about uh, when I got nicked up in Leeds. Yeah, go on. Let us know yeah. what happened there. Um, we, what we was doing, we had this geezer, he, he used to go around and uh, he used to visit a lot of firms and on, on, he used to try and get there on a payday because wages wages come in packets, in money, you know what I mean? There weren't no transfers of banks. And he'd go in and see it all being counted and work it out and it, it's, there weren't many cameras either. He, he'd look around for the cameras, he'd look around for the alarms because he used to go right behind the... Uh, I can't tell you too much about it because it get him nicked. But he used to go behind the jumps, you know, behind the counters and that and doing things behind there and he'd see where all the alarms were. So if someone was standing there saying so, you knew there was an alarm near him and all that and that's, that's how it went on. And did you get nicked for that job? No. no. Oh, yeah, Leeds I did, yeah. Oh, yeah, Leeds I did, yeah. How, how did they catch you? <laughs> Shaw Taylor. Who the Shaw Taylor? Mm -mm. He used to do a crime panel, keep them peeled. Right. And uh, we just changed cars. We was on our third car now. We are booted and suited. On our way, going to head back for London. Uh, got, got in the third car, completely clean. So was the one before that. Nothing knowing about it or nothing. And this little boy said to his mum, don't they, I mean, don't they look like bank robbers? I don't know what Northern <laughs> bank robbers look like. But <laughs> <laughs> we, I thought we looked like businessmen, but Whoa. and uh, she said, uh, "Don't be silly, so and so and so and so." And then, but he jotted the number down. The kid, the mother didn't. And then they're, they're driving home, and they come over the radio. They had some four people that had been shot on a robbery, and um, you know all the, all the different things that they was coming out with. And she she just phoned the old Bill, and give him the number. And of course, we're pulling down the M1 having a jolly up. And uh, all of a sudden, we looked at us. Said, "My mate, there ain't a lot of, lot of traffic, is there?" And he said, "Ain't a lot behind either." When we had a proper look, the, 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 all, the, all the embankment was covered in armed old Bill. The road was blocked with a coach in front of us, and there was two coaches side by side coming down behind us, blocking the road. So we weren't know where to go. We weren't, no, weren't no point of putting up a row, and I think because uh, they'd have shot us anyway. How did that feel as you could see them closing in on you? Well, I think I needed a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where did they take you? Uh, we first we went to um, some little police station, but they they they, uh, they said they never had an half armed old bill there for us. There was uh, four of us, four of us. Yeah, they said they they couldn't hold us there, <coughs> so they sent us to uh, Armory Armory Prison, I think it was, and we went in there. And they kept us here f until we got tried and sentenced. And then I went to Walton in Liverpool. They, they don't like you up there, you know. I don't know why, but they don't. <laughs> Perhaps because you shoot at people, I don't know. But they didn't like us. And uh, <clears throat> I went from there to um, Strange Ways. And uh, a bit of a tear up in Strange Ways. And, uh, Over what? Anything. <laughs> you just had a tear up, didn't you? Us against them, wasn't it? You know what I mean? So, um, went from there to uh, Wandsworth for a couple of weeks and then Sunny Isle of Wight and Parkhurst. And there was uh, 187 of us there, 800 cells, 187 prisoners. Place was alive with rats and everything. It was terrible, terrible, Nick. <coughs> um, about 40 IRA men there as well. You know what I mean? Everyone, everyone got on together because you had to. There was no saying I ain't talking to him because he's an IRA man. Cause 
he ain't worried about killing you. He's already doing 30 lives. <laughs> it didn't really matter. So everyone got on with everyone else. I mean, I, I made a friend there. Uh, he was an IRA man, and um, he weren't a, he weren't a, um, he didn't blow up supermarkets and that. He was an assassin, and um, I got on really well with him. Yeah, really well. So, how many years have you just covered over all those prisons? Sorry, over all those prisons, how many years was that? Twenty three. Twenty three. I done. Yeah. All right. Let's let's just go over a bit more slowly then. When you first got arrested on this case. On the leads, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How did the cops treat you? Um, they, they said when they knew it was Londoners because Northerners didn't use shotguns. <laughs> 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 I, I think they do now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they, they treated us all right. They weren't too bad. It was the screws who were the worst. The Northern screws didn't like us at all. Right. I Me, mean, I'd have three a day if I could, but... Uh, had you been to prison before this? No. Yeah. So how does that feel, your first day going into prison? Uh bit daunting um, how old were you at that point do you know I can't really remember um, probably late teens or 20s no 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 uh, about 30 I think about 30 about th th I can't hear you Mark sorry yeah so Leeds happened in 76 you're in your 30s yeah so you go in you're from the south you're up north yeah, bit daunting then. They don't like you. No, they don't like you. They got the like us in the end because we wouldn't we wouldn't back down from them. Every time someone you know had a go at us, we had a go at them. So what they done? They put us all on different wings. So we're on our own now. And I thought, well, and I'm, I'm the less good fighter out of a lot of them. So I thought, if I do someone, they're going to leave us alone. So all I done winning the dinner queue, queuing up. I thought he's big. And I had a go at him. I didn't win, <laughs> but um, it sort of made him think a bit better of us, sort of thing. You know what I mean? And the next day he was walking around the yard with me. You know, we was exercising together. And that's how we sort of got our way on. Because you're showing heart. Yeah, yeah, showing bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the screws had it in for you. No, don't say that. They, they just don't like southerners. Mm coming up here shooting people and all that you know what I mean yeah. that's what they used to say you know? how long were you on remand about a year I think 14 months or not and what did it feel to be facing a big sentence how did that feel I never really thought much about it I knew I was going to go away for a long time I mean my brief said 20 to 28 years I nearly fell over then but um, I, f I couldn't see myself getting that much I thought I'd get a 20 20 of 18 20 years and um all, i ended up getting a tw having to do a 12 so i had a, re had a result in one way or another you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah your expectations were adjusted so that when it came in lower it felt good yeah it felt good yeah but but what, when you're facing that 20 years you said you almost fell off your chair but after after that was it you just put, blocked it out it's just it's a different world isn't it you're in a you try and compare prison and out here mm. you can't compare it there is nothing to compare it with prison is dirty smelly everyone well not everyone but most of them don't really like to wash or you know, most of them only short term it was only us who stuck together, who was doing the big bits of bird, mostly Londoners, all stick together. You know, I mean, I made I made some good friends there, really good friends who I still know to today. And can you are you able to elaborate on any of those stories, your friends? Uh, not really, no. Not really. No. no okay. No. I want to go home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk us through going to court. What was that like? Um, you start opening us up. Uh, three screws to each 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 one of us. Uh, if it was a good screw, we'd get a shower, and then you put put your civilian clothes on. You know what I mean? They didn't like that either because our suits were all good suits. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like that at all. <laughs> and uh, then the uh, you, you the helicopter comes, so you knew you was on your way. Uh, get in the in the in the van. It's like a like a little, load of little cells either side of the van like a little corridor in the van and cells either side you've got one one each 
And then as, as the door shuts, a sort of a board comes over your legs, so you can't stand up. So you're, you're sort of stuck there like that then. Um, helicopter, you hear the helicopter go, then the outriders have come along. Uh, there, there was uh, four motorbikes, two police cars at the front, two at the back, and a van load of what they used to call SPG, mm. Special Patrol Group, all tooled up. I don't know what they thought we was, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, I don't think they'd had anything like us up north before. Did that get you extra respect? Because I suppose it did all a the bit. fanfare around the case. Yeah, I suppose it did a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Didn't give me no more food, though. <laughs> <laughs> what was the food? Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Disgusting. Can you remember what they served? Oh, God. I remember what it was supposed to be, but it never looked like that. Yeah, you used to get a lot of stews. Uh, well, that's what it mainly was, really, stews. Um, uh, on a Sunday, you used to get a slice of bacon, which must have come off a guinea pig. It was about that long. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it's on my life. I don't know where they where these pigs come from. Uh, you, you, uh, and then you get a, bo- a hard-boiled egg. And that was your Sunday breakfast. And a bowl of porridge if you wanted it. But I'd seen I'd seen them push those cockroaches underneath the porridge, so I, I, I was never going to ever eat that ever again. You know they were on the top in the morning because it's cooked the night before. And the kitchens are awash with cockroaches, and the screw come along one of their big down and push them all underneath. Oh. <laughs> I'm fine every now and then. <laughs> oh. They used to think it was a joke. You know what I mean? What about slopping out? Well, that 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 was still going on. Um, when I was there, um, open you up to get your pot. You try not to use your pot because you've got to be with it all night. You have a pee in it, but nothing else, you know what I mean? And um, you get out and um, try and get down to what they call the recess, which is where the toilets are, wash basins, and all that. you're not allowed to use the wash basins, by the way. <laughs> uh, get down there, uh, Try and get to one of the toilets. I think there was two, four, four toilets on a, on a whole whole landing. Four toilets, and you try and get there before someone peed all over the seat, or worse still, you know what I mean. And um, <coughs> then you back to your cell, go down and, and get your porridge. Well, not I didn't take porridge. I used to take a couple of slices of bread. You could have four slices of bread then. You can have as many as you want now. You used to have four slices. And uh, a bit of this grease stuff. Uh, it was like a. Um, it was supposed to be, supposed to be marge, but you could no one see through it. If you know what I mean. I don't know, I don't know what it was made out of. It didn't taste very nice, but it, at least it made the bread go down. You know. What else was different back then? Uh, you've got televisions now. You never had them then. Uh, you had to do so many years before you could have a, a radio. Uh, three years before you could have a watch. I think now I think you can have you can get them. You keep your watch with you when you go in. You know what I mean? They take your tom off yeah and uh, put it in safekeeping. You hope. I got I got all mine back anyway. So I was all. Right. Did you have to have cellmates? No, I never had a cellmate. Oh, I did once. Yeah, no, they were. Uh, I was considered. Uh, Unfit to share a cell. That's good, isn't it? You can't beat your own cell. <laughs> no, you can't. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's 23 and a half hours a day banged up, it's better than sharing with someone. Yeah. Because they usually stick you with someone dirty, and you know what I mean? What about violence that just happened around you? <coughs> Did you see anything happen? Yeah, I nearly got uh, killed twice. Hold on then, so let's slow down. I was, what, uh, what were they over? Nothing. Over nothing. I was I was standing in the in the queue, uh, waiting for the phone. This is when the phones come on on the landings. You know, you have a card. Yeah. Going there and standing there, and you, you always got your eyes about you. Yep. And I was looking around. You know, I mean, just standing there and chatting to the geezer behind me, and the geezer in front of me, and I thought, the geezer keeps he seems to be getting closer and closer. He was silly, really, because he had stripes on, yellow stripes. He was an escapee, so he stood out a bit. <laughs> He keeps getting closer and closer. Then, all of a sudden, I, I knew he, he was coming for me, and I see it come down out of his sleeve. He had a um, like a loo brush, you know, the long loo brushes. He'd broke the end off and done it with a lighter or something, and um, pointed it up. And um, 
I see him. He, I said to him, that, that for me, and he went, yeah, it's for you, Fieldsy. Oh, and I'll tell you what I said. I can't swear, can I? I said, uh, if, you, if you don't go away, I'm going to take that off you, ram it up your arse, and I'll take your teeth out to get it out. And he looked at me, and he just dropped it and ran. Thank <laughs> Christ. <laughs> Financial anxiety, anyone? Worrying about it doesn't help? Earn in does. Earn in is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the Earn In app and verify your paycheck. Then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. If Jen wants a special night out or another bloody expensive handbag, I'm going to have to turn to Earn In. Make Earn In a part of your financial routine and join Earn In's over 3.5 million customers who say things like, when I think about Earn In, I think about financial stability and security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earn In today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earn In app, type in Sean Atwood on the podcast. That's S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T, Wood. When you sign up, it'll really help this show. That's Sean Atwood on the podcast. Earn In is a financial tech company, not a bank, subject to your available earnings, daily max, pay period, max, and location. See earnin.com forward slash TOS for details. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Earn In. Back to the podcast. The link is in the description box below this video if you're watching it on YouTube. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other time, it, it just, we was, all, we was all standing about talking and it, it just, exploded everything just went mad people were uh hitting people with chairs and gone oh what's going on here so oh, me and me mate we just there was three of us who should uh, um have a cup of tea together we just got our backs against the wall and waited for anyone to come near us but they didn't come near us well they knew we'd hurt them if they did <laughs> <laughs> but they were doing everybody else for nothing that first situation then with the guy why was he targeting you? He wanted to make a name for himself. Yeah, he wanted to make. He said to the screw. I thought if I killed him, I'd make a name for myself. He said you wouldn't have got off the wing alive. His mates would have killed you. <laughs> but he thought he could just walk out and plunge me and go down the block for a little while and then, uh, you know, in the solitary cells and come back and be uh, Jack the Lad. Hero of the North. Yeah, hero of the North. Yeah. <laughs> did that happen a lot, or did people were people worry? People are always wary of if, mm. if if they if they know you know everybody, mm. and everyone oh, hello, hello everyone how are you how's so and so I've seen was sends his regards and all that and they people hear these names coming out and like, oh, Fred sends his regards Joe sends his regards or Ron and Reggie you know what I mean and then people sort of think, oh, steer a bit clear of him or give him a bit of respect. Every now and then was there a lone nutcase who just tried to do something. I see a geezer get killed, killed at the bottom of the, the stairs. Stairs are like in prison, are like fire escapes. And uh, he took some, took a bowl of porridge, a bowl of cornflakes. It was a Sunday morning. You get cornflakes, and um, this geezer whose cornflakes he took never ever come down for his cornflakes. Never. So he said, "Give us so and so's." The con just dished them out to him. You know what I mean? And uh, that morning the bloke came down with him. So he's just got to the bottom of the stairs and he's come up behind him and, and killed him. Stabbed him in the back. Back of the neck, I think it was. Yeah, no one got his cornflakes. They went all over the floor, didn't they? So when you see stuff like that happen, what's the protocol? Just keep moving? Don't yeah, look. just keep moving. Yeah, you don't see nothing, do you? Who see anything? No one see anything. What's happened then? <laughs> you know what I mean? Once you got sentenced... Yeah. How did that feel on that day, then just a relief? Bit of a relief, yeah, because I got less than I thought I was going to get, even though I got a lump. Mm. Um, I knew wherever I went I'd be all right because of Joe. Joe. Joe found out where I was going. Uh, he'd send word there when I got to Parkhurst. It was two o'clock in the morning and the twins were waiting for me in reception at two <laughs> o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Screw said to me, you must be someone important. I said, why is that? He said... You got a couple of people waiting to say hello. Uh, it's Ron and Reg, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, letting them out there. Still, was in the top security prison. Could you give the viewers the background of your history with the twins? How did you get get to know them? Um, 
I got to know the twins, uh, Ron and Reg, I got to know in um, in Parkhurst um, through the few few years that we were together there. And uh, when I come out, uh, Charlie, Charlie was out and about and he used to come over and see Joe and um, we'd all go drinking and, and, and Joe would say, uh, I'm going to, going to Broadmoor and more. Do you fancy a ride out? And I'd say, yeah, I'll kind of, you know, go to Broadmoor and see Ronnie. Or, or Park or and see Reggie, where you know, wherever it was we was going. And that's really how it started. And what kind of men were they when you met them in person? Oh, they were right. Yeah, I mean, you had to keep your eye on Ronnie because he was a bit... <laughs> 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 he was a bit funny at times, but... Yeah, they, I mean, I was, he, he tipped a bucket of scolding tea over a geezer's head once because he thought the bloke had slighted him. We were all watching the telly, well not all of us, about six of us, in a room about this size. The telly we're down here, we'd be up there, the geezer come round, a big stainless steel bucket full of tea. And uh, he was pouring it out, he done Reggie's, done mine, he done Ron's, we only give him half a cup. So, very polite Ron, excuse me, the bloke said, yes Ron, he said, could I have the bucket a minute? He the bucket, the boss just tipped it over his head, scalding it was. Scream. Reg, Reg jumped up. Screws never moved. Reg jumped up. He said, what are, you doing? what are you doing? He said, he only gave me half a cup. He said, you only ever have half a cup. He said, yeah, but he didn't know that. He's new. He said, don't you think the other geezer might have told him? <laughs> the, the bloke weren't dishing the tea out no more after that. He, oh, he must have burnt him something terrible. I'll never see him again. But... Oh, he, he, I could see his skin bubbling, you know. Because he's just, just come out of the kitchen, this tea. That lot would us up for the day. <laughs> Any other stories of them like that? Funny stories or? Uh, not with the twins, really. Uh, I mean, everyone was wary of the twins, especially when they were together. Uh, when, when we only went to Broadmoor, and there, there was just Reg, Reg left in Parkhurst, there was Reg, a um, couple of the old faces, you know, Fred and all that, they were there, and... Um, The balance has sort of changed, if you know what I mean. They weren't the same when they're not together. I'm not saying they're cowards, never a coward, never at all. But Ronnie seemed quite, uh, Reggie seemed quieter without Ronnie. He wasn't keep looking about him all the time. Cause Reggie, Reggie steamed, uh, Ronnie had seemed steam into someone for no reason at all. The bloke wouldn't even know he'd done anything wrong until Ron told him when, they, when he came to, or whatever, you know. All right, so we were at the point then where they met you, you got moved, you got sentenced, and they, you arrived at the prison and they met you. And did you settle into that prison quite easily because you knew yeah, people? Yeah, very easy, yeah. Good. yeah. Well, everyone, everyone knew, it all went round all round the nick that uh, some, someone else had come and uh, the, the twins had met them and uh, they said, oh, he's, a, good, you know, oh, he's a friend of Joey Poles, this, that and the other. And uh, yeah, I had quite an easy run really through prisons. So what was your routine when you got to that prison? Well, same as everybody else is uh, up in the morning, cup of tea, um, a bowl of porridge, but not for me. <laughs> <laughs> cup of tea, cut the slices of bread. Uh, then they used to go off to work. What, what was I work? I was working on the gardens. No, I wasn't. I was on the on the works at first. Then I went onto the gardens because because uh, uh, Parkers was uh, maximum security or top security, whatever they want to call it now. Everyone, everyone worked. Everyone went to work. You know, they, they weren't, weren't like in a local nick, like the scrubs are saying. Because you're a double A or something, you can't go out yourself. In in, in sort of prisons, you can. What was your favourite jobs? My well, favourite jobs. What in the nick or? Yeah, in the nick. <laughs> Kitchen. Kitchen. <laughs> Getting the food. <laughs> yeah, I, I was. I was. A, I ended up as a red band in the kitchen. Because I was the only one who get the geezers to do what the screws wanted. So they, they said, we're going to give you a red band. I don't want a red band. They went, no, you have a red band. He said, don't worry. No one to say nothing about it. I said, no, they won't. So he said, just get everyone to do what they're supposed to do. I said, well, what's that? You know, you just give me half ounce of tobacco a week. and Come on, lads, let's get stuck in. <laughs> Did you get a access to extra food? Yeah, yeah. I used, I used, to, I used to do the... Um, the fry, I used to do a fry up at night time for all the kitchen boys. 
uh, uh, 20 eggs on a big griddle thing. <laughs> uh, anything else that <laughs> slipped by the net would go on in the frying pan, you know, a big frying pan, a griddle and that. Yeah, so I used to do the cooking every night, egg, bacon, sausage. What jobs didn't you like? I never had one I didn't like, to tell you the truth. Not that I can think of. Most most prisons keep you banged up. It's only it's only the long term prisons that you're out of. Uh, local nicks you're banged up anyway, like Wandsworth. They'll let you out of Wandsworth if they can help it. What about gym and fitness? Yeah, they, I, used to, I used to do quite a lot of weightlifting at one. They wouldn't think it now. But I, I was a good weightlifter. And uh, I used to like going weightlifting. I used to do now weightlifting. <coughs> and then. Um, uh, three mile run around the, the track. I used to do that nearly every day. But then then, I, then someone come in one day with some, what they call ooch, <laughs> which is, you know what ooch is, oh, you must do, yeah. <laughs> I keep forgetting you've been there and all. And uh, that was the end of my training regime for, <laughs> for a few months. I was, Ill. I was so ill, it was unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, people reckon they can down a bottle of whiskey. Mm. I like to see them down a bottle of this gear. <laughs> do, do you know what the hooch recipe was back then? Uh, usually rice or taters, yeah, tater peelings, rice, a bit of fruit if you could, just for the flavour. <laughs> <laughs> no, some uh, or, oranges if you could get older one, because you only get uh, orange a few times a year. So, what about visits and relationships? Did you have a girlfriend or anything uh, like that? I had, I had a, a, a wife and a little girl. Uh, that finished. Not me little girl, but the wife, and uh, that was on the first sentence. On the, on the second sentence, uh, I thought everything was going well, and um, come to me release, and uh, stand the man just pulled up outside the nick, you know, rolled up, picked me up, and I'm, I said, where is she? And he went, oh, he said, there's a few quid there for you, and oh, there's some vodka in the bar, but where is she? And there's a glass under, I went, where is she staying? What's the matter? He went, she's not with you no more, Ron. But there you are. You just had to go and get some more, I suppose. But <laughs> you know, where I was at, when a woman stopped visiting a guy, you'd often see them looking out the window at the car park, the car's not coming, and some of those guys, it really devastated them. How did you feel emotionally at that point in time? Well, if someone never turned up for a visit? No, if you're, you got... You know, if, if your partner, your wife, finished it, yeah, did it did it hit you hard or? You, no, I had you, a lot of mates anyway. Yeah, I, I expected it. I mean, it's twelve mm -hmm. years, long time, isn't it? It is. You know what I mean, you can't expect someone to hang about with. You. I had the ump, mind you, I did. Yeah, he, and he knew I had and all because he mm -hmm. was in hospital for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, it's going to happen, isn't it? Yeah, mine lasted a year. Did it? <laughs> yeah, that well, it still you. hurt. It still hurt. Yeah, but you know, you, 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 nothing you can do about it, is there? There's nothing. You know, all I could do was send a message out. You know, make sure, make sure um, he didn't enjoy it himself. Because <laughs> I was feeling like it, I felt bad that she was serving the prison time with me. Yeah. It was like it was rough on her. Yeah. yeah she hadn't done any crimes. I did no. the crimes. If my, my missus had been serving her prison, my prison time with, with me, we, we'd have been in the red line, I think, because that's the only place she used to go. <laughs> yeah. So over the, over the years of that first sentence then, what, what stories have we missed out? Is there anything? Not that I can think of, no. There, probably, there must be thousands, but I, I, I just can't bring them to mind. Have you got anything written down there? That yeah, yeah, let, let, let's go back to the notes then. Because we, 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 I think we might have jumped ahead a bit. <clears throat> so, um, you rescued a businessman's daughter. Oh yeah, yeah. What's that yeah. story? Oh, that was that. Uh, I used to, I used to do a lot of work. Uh, you know, that sort of work with, with a, a very good mate of mine. He's dead. He's died now. Terry, Terry, his name was, and um, we was in the red line having a drink, and the geezer used to fly about. A, a, a ducker and diver and organiser. We used to call him collars and cuffs because he was always shooting his cuffs and and all that. You know, what I mean, he said he said uh, got a little job if you want to do it. So I said, what's that? He said, uh, he said uh, this this fella. I, I can't tell you the name because it's a really big firm. Yeah, now. no names. And um, he said his daughter. This geezer's got hold of his daughter. He's got her. 
in her drugs. Uh, she looks like she's going to end up on the game, and they're saying, you know, he said, would you have a word with him? So uh, we said, yeah, we said, have a word with him. He said, how much is it going to cost? So we told me how much it's going to cost. Uh, he paid us straight away. There uh, wasn't much he could have done if we never went and done it, but that ain't the way to do things. You, know, you say you're going to do something, you do it. And uh, we, we had a chat with this geezer, uh, severe chat. I shot a few holes in his car doors and all that sort of, just to let him know, you know what I mean? Silly things when you think about it, but he got, he got the message. And um, this, bloke's, this bloke's other daughter was getting married. And they asked if we'd like to go, you know what I mean? So mm. all these top hats and that, uh, we bowled up like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but he, tra- he treated us very well, the fella. He really did. He's quite an household name now. So you actually got a job with Securicore at one yeah, point. Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> what was your motivation? See inside the vans, probably. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't screen you or anything? Yeah, they did. Yeah, I never had a criminal record, did I? True. Yeah, I never had a criminal record. Yeah. yeah. So how long did you stay with them? Six weeks. Six weeks? Yeah. And did you get the information? Because not all the vans are the same, see? The newer ones are different. The old ones used to have, have the uh, safe at the side. And they used to be able to chop the side of the van out because it was only tin. But now they, they then they started sticking them in the middle. Because I don't know if you heard about the, the chainsaw gang. They used to go around cutting cutting the sides out of the security vans because so, it was straight into the safe. But now they started sticking the safes in the middle of the vans. So you couldn't cut into them then. So I, I assume there were some successful jobs. Mm. And um, you took on a job where you were hired to de- deter thugs who wanted pr- protection money from a, a pub owner. That's right, yeah. yeah. That, that was a <coughs> pub owner in Red Hill. And uh, he was a friend of Joe's, the, the governor there, and he was getting some assholes. They was coming in from, I don't know how, how they ever thought they were going to get away with it, but... They were going in and they wanted money, so he, he phoned up and uh, he said, uh, tell them to come back on Friday. So they come back on Friday and uh, me and Cornish were in there, a mate of mine, he's just died. And uh, the governor said, uh, that's them there. So I said, call them into the kitchen. The kitchen was behind the bar, so he called them through. They thought he was going through to get their bit of wedge, but through the door come me and Cornish. And I, I had a... Uh, um, Astra, it, it was a, um, like a, a small automatic, and um, uh, Cornish had a meat cleaver which he picked up as he went in, and uh, <coughs> I sat the gun in the geezer's mouth and explained the rights and wrongs of it and all that and other, <coughs> and I ejected a bullet, you know, you just pulled a slide, well you know about guns, pulled a slide back, the bullet came out, I caught it, I said, open your mouth, he opened his mouth, I went, now swallow. <laughs> <laughs> made him swallow it <laughs> and Cornish was just going to chop this geezer's hand off on the on the big kitchen chopping block but I said to him I think we've done enough I thought well, we ain't never going to get away with chopping someone's hand off in a pub on a Friday night <laughs> 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 but Mick didn't really bother about things like that <laughs> so they backed off they disappeared after that they would never see him again yeah they never see him again oh well good on you they had that, definitely had that coming didn't they um, you know, you did mention your wife, but, but how, how did you actually meet your wife? Um, I was I was working for a landscape gardener. I was fifteen, I think. Yeah, fifteen, and I was doing landscape gardening, and uh, I was having my sixteenth birthday party. And um, her mother was always round the house, round this house, you know, where I, the bloke I was working for, and she said. You having a party, and you run? I said, yeah. She said, uh, can my little girl come? I thought, God, dear me. I went, yeah, of course you can. I said, I'll come and pick her up. I was expecting to go and see a, you know, a young little girl, but uh, she was quite a sort, really. <laughs> 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 and uh, we ended up getting married. Lasted about 10 years, I think. No, in ten years, I had a little. Well, we had two girls, but I have a little girl died. Oh my god! Um, my daughter Sadie, um, yeah, she's quite an handful. <laughs> oh dear! 
Um, Ronnie Fryer, who was that? Mad Ronnie. Oh, he was a nut I used to run around tooting. Uh, very unpredictable. He was, he was my... He, he was the same sort of temperament as, as uh, Ronnie Cray. You, know, you never, under, never knew what he was going to do. Uh, we had Me and Terry had a car front in Tooting. And uh, he ended up killing one of Joe's mates on the car front over, over a tenner, I think it was. Over a tenner? Something like that. That's how nutty he was. Yeah, mad Ronnie Fryer, yeah. And um, anyway, after he got nicked and... Um, he got nicked and we got nicked and we're up north and he's in Wandsworth and Joe sent a message, I'm getting getting you moved down to Wandsworth. We knew why. So um, they moved they moved Terry, but they didn't move me, they left me up there. And uh, Ronnie Fryer um, jumped off the Fours landing. He took a, some sort of pill and then jumped off the landing. So they say. <laughs> <laughs> and then... That was the end of him. Same year, a man shot Ronnie in the street. A man shot you in the street. Yeah, he shot me in the leg, yeah. yeah. What, what was the background on that? I don't know. You don't know? No. But what? he used a silly little gun because <laughs> I pushed the bullet out of my finger. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was too far away and the gun was <clears throat> too small. Yeah. So, so there was... Um, a shot fired back. Yeah. Yeah. Better gun. Bigger gun. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> All right. So we, we talked about the wage snatch in Leeds. Then it was Armley Jail, Parkhurst, Isle of Wight. Welcome by the craze. Um, Graham Young, the poisoner, oh, the was poisoner, in there, was he? Yeah. I was a I didn't know I told Martin that. Um, What's his story then for the viewers who are not familiar? Uh, uh, Martin, he, he, he was a um, habitual poisoner of people. He poisoned all his family, all his workmates, and uh, then one day he ended up in Parkhurst. So uh, everyone used to keep an eye on him in the dinner queues, you know, he was sprinkling no powder over the food or nothing. Because, you know, you queue up and food's there. And you get to the end and you've got your plate full of food. And you didn't really want him behind you or in front of you. <coughs> so, um, well, I think we used to get uh, about one pound, one pound fifty a week, something like that, wages. So we, we run, out of, uh, run out of tea, sugar and everything. So I was just leaning on the landing, looking down. Uh, I see I see that Graham Young walking about. And I went right. So I went down to the screw and I went, Governor, you know me. I said I'd never come to you with anything. Uh, I don't run around telling tales, but I've just seen that Graham Young coming out of your tea room. Well, they went down there for everything in the bin. <laughs> we went down and took it all out. <laughs> all their coffee, sugar, powdered milk, everything. They threw it all away and we 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 collected it up. <laughs> because I read somewhere that he did actually manage. To poison some staff. He did, yeah. Food yeah. Or tea. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did do, did poison a couple. Yeah, bless him. <laughs> he, he got a cheer for that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the Yorkshire Ripper. When I was a kid, that was a he, huge he was story. In as well, the Yorkshire Ripper. Peter Sutcliffe. Yeah. So what did you interact with him? What was no, he, no, 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 no. But he no, was in there. He, he was what, killed women, didn't he? And yeah. No, he, he was there, but um. They built him his own exercise yard on the back of a cell that went into the sort of the, the compound in between the four wings. There's a sort of like an area. And they built him a little um, exercise yard so he could come out of his cell straight into this little yard and walk about. So he was trying to think, how are we going to get hold of him? And like one day he, said, he said, you may sound, sound funny, he said, but a bow and arrow. I thought he was right, you know. <laughs> just lean out the window and pop him, <laughs> <laughs> pop him in the top of the over the bar an hour. But uh, I think it come on top. I think they got the, got wind of it and they moved him to um, Wakefield. I think it was Monster Mansion. The Monster Mansion, yeah, yeah. I've been there uh, visiting, not monsters, but I was going, I was going to visit Charlie Bronson and a few other people there. Who was Peter Cook? Cambridge rape. Uh, Peter Cook. He, he was a Cambridge rapist. He used to round, ride around dressed up as a woman what? with head scarf on. What? Uh, women never expect that coming along. You know, he's a boss and 
No. But um, there was, I mean, he got a lot, he, he never never went on 43, rule 43 is when you go on protection yeah. from other cons and that. He would never go on it and he took some hidings and I thought to myself and I said to a couple of other people, you know, I've taken a lot of hiding though for someone, you know, and uh, well, they, they said he's always saying he never done it. I don't think he did do it because the amount of hidings he took, he never went on 43 or nothing. And he was no, um, he had both sexual parts, homophodite. Hermaphrodite. Is that what it is? Yeah. I'm glad you could say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was one of them, so he, wow. he, he couldn't have raped anyone anyway. Wow. But they still put my wife for life, didn't they? I don't know his story. I'll have to look into that, yeah, but that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. Was, would you call him again? Hermaphrodite. Yeah, I'll call him a Hermaphrodite. <laughs> <laughs> he was weird, though. Yeah. He was weird. I mean, it, it, if there, there was 10 or 12 of us standing here talking, he wouldn't walk round, he'd walk through you. And he was only little. You know, a little gazer. But he's, 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 Very raw. He f- f- thought to himself, I'm going to get annoyed and I'll get it anyway. <laughs> yeah, same in America, you know. If, if, anyone, if anyone's harmed women or kids, yeah. they try and kill them when they yeah. come in. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine they do. Yeah. Same world over, I should think. Good riddance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Freddie Foreman was in, in, in there as well, was he? Freddie yeah, oh, yeah, with Fred, yeah. We have a drink every Friday night in Maidstone. The screw used to give us a bottle of vodka. Well, he didn't give it to us. He used to sell us a bottle of vodka. Uh, it went up to about hundred pound in the end, so we packed it up for a bottle, you know, <laughs> a liter bottle. But we used to have a good drink on a Friday. <laughs> me and Fred and a couple of the others. Who was Ronnie Easterbrook? Oh, you should look him up. Ronnie was so quiet. He, he, he got. Um, oh, well, I can't think what his mate's name was now. Um. They, they, him and his mate both got shot by the old Bill. The old Bill were waiting for him. And uh, they shot Ronnie. Ronnie went down. And um, what was his mate's name? Tony someone, Tony. Tony something, was it? Tony something. It was Tony something, yeah. He put his hands on his head. And, and the cousin walked over and shot him. <laughs> then he started walking over towards Ronnie. And Ronnie's laying on the floor. He's already got shot. But he's still got his gun underneath his leg. So the guzzers come over. Point, going to finish him off. So everyone shot him. What else could he do? He, sh- he didn't kill him, but he shot him. And um, um, he was at Parkhurst with us. And um, I was having a cup of tea in his cell one day. And we went out for a walk. Walked around the yard, you know what I mean? Come back and there was a brown envelope on his bed so he picked it up flung it on one side he said you want sugar and so and so and so and so made a cup of tea I said yeah, you look at that he said I know what it is I said do you and yeah he opened it up and uh, he said have a read and it was compute, um, turning his 30 years into natural life mm. and it didn't bother him he never bothered him one little bit he was so staunch every time in the unit he'd come into the unit with us don't forget there's only 12 of you in a unit you've got three screws to each man if it goes off, you're swamped. I mean, he was he was tall and thin. He probably didn't weigh nine stone, but he didn't care. Like, he'd break a leg off a chair, and he'd bosh, he was in there before you even knew the road started. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, he couldn't stand screws. He hated, he hated them. He hated them. And I, I, I mean, I don't like screws, but but there was a couple that um, were very fair, very fair. I must say, one one was a, um, a sort, sort of a. a a governor, but he weren't a governor, but they used to call him governor, and, and uh, he, he was very good to me. I don't know why, but he was. And there was another one. He was in charge of the gardens, and um, I was sitting in my cell one day reading a book, and he opened me up. And he went, "Do you want to come work with me, Phil?" I went, "What are you doing, governor?" He said, "He's some gardens officer." I went, "Yeah, I'll have some of that." He said, "You've got to give me your word. You won't run away." I said, oh, you got me word. Because I, it was well known then that if I give me word, that I would never break it. And I gave him me word, and one day I was standing outside the gate sweeping up. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> 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 yeah, all the screws were looking at me. <laughs> I was. <it. laughs> what was the... Mind you, I'd done about eight years then. <laughs> what was the build-up to the prison riots in Parkhurst? Food. Lack of food, poor food. Poor food. Poor f- and rats, poxy rats were everywhere. You pull your bed back, a poxy rat will be in your bed, you know. 
Did you have to fight off the rats? We didn't have to fight them off, but they would have had a rat if you wanted to <laughs> have a big one. Yeah, the, the, it was a food. It was a food. It was a rat. And a brutality in the, in the punishment cells. You went down there, you got a good hiding. Always. Even, you know, even blokes who couldn't fight. Hey, do you know what that sound means? Ooh, that's something I've been hearing a lot lately. I can't help but love that. That's what I hear when I make another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. The Pokemon business I've recently started with someone is absolutely thriving thanks to Shopify. Shopify accepts all kinds of payments and sometimes it's complex when you get on a platform, but their dashboard makes it completely simple. Covering all your sales channels from a shopfront ready POS system to its all in one e commerce platform. Shopify even gets you selling across social media marketplaces like Facebook, Insta, TikTok, and YouTube. Full of the industry leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without learning new skills in design or coding. And thanks to award winning help and with an extensive business course library, Shopify is ready to support your success every step of the way. So when it comes to dealing with people all over the world, Shopify is absolutely enabling us to smash it with our Pokemon business. Before Shopify, our Pokemon card business was in the dark ages. It's time to get serious about selling and get Shopify today. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.co.uk slash Sean. Link in description box below this video on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Back to the podcast. Oh, look after themselves. Even they got annoyed. You know, silly things they go down there for too much tobacco. And they just had to beat them up. It's just the way they were. Because uh, one time, um, chokey screws never never walked the landings. Well, they couldn't because someone would done it with a jug of boiling water or something. <coughs> But I think it's changed now. They they have to walk the landings and all now, so they're a lot better down the block. <laughs> Got to behave themselves. Yeah, because they, they know someone will get them. Someone will get them. Was the riot something that just burst out, well, it, or was it, it organised? It, it, it was brewing and brewing, and uh, uh, I come out of myself. I was just going to go on exercise, and uh, I, I had these up now boots. <laughs> always found they were very handy <laughs> uh, they had a pair of them now boots and um, all of a sudden I was just talking to my mate who was next to me he was a well known arm robber I won't say his name but he, he, was, he was a good arm robber all of a sudden uh, we was on the uh, on the freeze and there was a dustbin come flying by from the fours ablaze and I said to my mate get your boots on mate it's going off he went bleeding oh yeah he went and got his boots on <laughs> and they all come up with their sticks and Shields and God knows what, and they scream a lot, you know, screws. I don't know why they do. It. They, they shout when they're coming out, they screaming their heads off, you know, like a load of Indians. I used to laugh. At them. <laughs> how how long did the riot last? What, what? Oh, we, we had we had we had the uh, we had D wing for a whole day, whole day we had D wing, and they brought all the screws in from uh, Elberty and Camp Hill, you know, two prisons, other prisons on the Isle of Wight. They brought all them in, but they didn't want to come in. They didn't want to come in with us. We were all, all cat A's, weren't we? So, you know, we were ordinary prisoners. We are the ones they say are, are violent. And we were, you know, I, mean, I suppose we was in a way, but nothing like they were trying to paint us to look like. What happened during that day? Was there a lot of damage done? There was a lot of scores settled. <laughs> a lot of debts were collected. <laughs> uh, there was a couple of geezers who, who got really bad there who should have been. Someone, someone just said they were the nonce. And before you knew what was happening, they was laying out on the wire, smashed to pieces, and they weren't nonces. Bloke said, "I know them. They they come from where I come from." Oh. And the bloke who said it, we couldn't find him. Oh. He, he'd put himself on forty three, but he got them two 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 of the geezers really badly hurt. Because did he have a problem with them? So he just set them up. Yeah, I mean, they them some tobacco or something. Mm, what, a yeah. piece, what a piece of rubbish. But, you know, you say a child killer, everyone's, you need, everyone's got a, a mm. child relation, haven't they, mm. in the nick? Everyone's got someone, haven't they? Yeah, in America, if you accuse someone of that, you've got to show the paperwork, otherwise you get done. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. That's how it should be here, really. Because people, so many people trying to get set people up. Yeah. Yeah. I should imagine a lot more people get killed in American prisons than they do in British ones. There is, there is a lot of it going yeah. on. Yeah. So how did the riot end? Angry. <laughs> 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 it was angry. <laughs> we had no food for two days before that. And you, you ain't exactly full up all the time, are you? So we, we got it, then they brought, some, brought something on and it smelled really nice. And I said to my mate, that smells good, doesn't it? He said, Shall we call it a day? I went, Shall we? <laughs> so, how, how did you call it a day? Did you have to go back to your cells? No, did but look, there, there weren't much of your cells left. The cells were all smashed up, but yeah. I always kept, kept, kept my plate yeah. and my cup and my mug and uh, my spoon. So, so, I'm going down. So, so, they had it all dished out. And, where are you going, Ron? I said, I'm going to get something. I went about enough. Good old, I'll come here. But in the end, we all just went down and got fed, you know what I mean? Mm. So they didn't come in and batter you? No, no, oh. no, not then. About a week later, they did. Did they? About a week later, they come in and battered everyone, one yeah. after the other. Yeah, you could hear them coming along the cells. You could hear the cell door. And they're tapping you and go, you're next. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> what happened when they came for you? They came for me. I was, I was up in the corner. Up in the corner, I had the leg off the corner table. You know, I don't know if you've seen them little corner table. I had the leg off of that. But they come in, they, uh, didn't stand a chance really. They they just bashed us up in the corner of them shields. Have, have you seen them shields? They bashed me up in the corner, but they had to reach over the top and it, you only have them. <laughs> 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 they, 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 we didn't have a chance really. Got a couple of digs in, but I never been much of a fighter really. I, I'd rather plot up on someone. <laughs> and how long did they batter you for? Oh, just until you couldn't stand up. Then, when you're laying on the floor, they'd give you a couple of kicks and go f next door. Then, but it weren't no good making out you was hurt because they knew if they'd hurt you or not. Was that the last place you were at before the release in '86? The last place I was at '86. Mason. How did it feel approaching your release? Well, they, were, they threw a big party for me. <laughs> they really did. They really did, yeah. And I don't know if you ever see a film, I can't think who was in it, but as this geezer was walking down the stairs to, to leave the nick, they were all singing, he's a jolly good fella, and they'd done that for me. <laughs> all my life, all my baby's life, they did. They said, he's a jolly good fella, and I thought, bleed, I, I could have cried. All my life, I really could, yeah. What was your plans for when you got out? Go and get some money. <laughs> you buy the methods? The usual method. Usual method, yeah. Usual method. When, when, when it come out, <coughs> I went to see Joe. Had some breakfast with Joe. Uh, he gave me a nice few quid. What he'd collected off the off a few of the boys, Fred and all that. They all they all uh, chucked a few quid in. You know what I mean? No, so I didn't have to worry for six seven months really. I don't know. When I got some club I made, some shirts and suits made in it. So on the visit then to Broadmoor with. Oh. Charlie uh, Cray and Joe Pyle, were you given a hit list? No, it was, it was Ronnie Cray. Ronnie Cray. Ronnie Cray. Ronnie Cray. Yeah. Cray. <coughs> yeah was, were you given a hit list? I was. I was sitting there, and um, you, you're always a bit wary of Ronnie, especially if his feet started shuffling. He, he, he was building out a summit, and he's leant across the table, and he went read that light, and he stuck a bit of paper. I went, "All right, man." Yeah. Anyway, the visit was over. Went out, was sitting in the mail, I said, oh, I said, oh, I've got this here. <laughs> There's 12 names on it. I went, oh, what's that, Joe? He said, he wants you to kill him. I went, I want him. <laughs> he went, yeah. I went, play now. I said, what do I do? And he went, I do nothing. So we go the week after, and he, he says to me, uh, maybe a fortnight after, he said, uh, have you done any of them? I went, no, not yet, Ron. I'm planning it all day. He went, leave them, leave them. Don't do them. <laughs> give me another list. <laughs> you dare my life, give me another bleak list, yeah. Oh, well, I'm never going to get out of this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, give me another list. <laughs> and did it go on and on like that? Oh, you, every week? You, you list? can't imagine what it's like sitting in front of someone like that. And you know he's a psych, you know, a raving mm. lunatic. You know, even I mean, I, I got his bracelet. He gave me his bracelet. Um, Why did he give you his bracelet? He just said to me, he said, your your, your name's the same as mine. I mean, yeah, well, of course it is. Yeah, he went on when you had that. He gave me that. And then I got his gold cufflinks with, R, with an R on them, you know what I mean? He gave me them. 
And I said, my only friends, Ron. I thought he was trying to chat me up. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said we're only mates. <laughs> His, his wife was looking for a bodyguard. Keith. Yeah, that, that, that was me and Cornish, yeah, yeah. So did you actually um, perform that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've done that for years. Were yeah. there any situations that you had to prevent? Uh, just silly silly people want to come over and give her a kiss and have their photo took. Uh, Kate weren't like that. Kate never drunk. You would have a glass in her hand. It was tonic water and a slice of lemon. She never drunk. And, you know, people want to come, oh, give her a kiss, Kate. Can I have my photo took kissing, you know? Uh, Go on, F off. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Have you ever met her? I've not, no. No? no. Nice lady. Yeah, sounds yeah, she like is, it. Yeah, she's got a, got a pro proper brain on her head. Mm. So, Diamonds was the next one. What was it, Diamonds? That got, the next that one? got you caught. Uh, oh, yeah, well, one of them got caught on, yeah. <laughs> what, what was the preparation and planning for that? Uh, we, uh, about four weeks, four weeks back and forth to uh, Gatwick. And. Uh, they, they thought we was after £10 million worth of gold. I don't know what they thought we was going to put got all that gold in in a, in, a, in a console, you know what I mean? But they must have thought we was going to, but it was £10 million of diamonds we was after. But, um, went there that morning. That, that morning I said to uh, John, he's dead now, Johnny Folder. I said to him, I said, I'm pulling off of this, John. It's t this is taking too long, all this messing about. He says, he says will, you, will you just run me down there today, just in case? I went, yeah, I'll run you down. Run him down there, sitting in the car, just going to go home. And uh, da, 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 da. Oh. All popping up out of boots of cars and yeah, all guns and everything. That's unlucky. Oh, yeah, I thought, oh, I needed this. If I'd have said, no, you have to get down there, I wouldn't have been there. Mind you, they probably still done me with a conspiracy because it, it was on top for weeks, really. They was watching us for weeks. So what jail did you end up on remand? Lewis. Lewis. Only, only for a couple of weeks. The governor said he, he couldn't handle us. He said, I can't have him here. So they sent us to uh, Wonzo. Wonzo. They can handle anyone there. <laughs> and it sounds like you're established, everything was okay in prison. Mm, yeah. Back to your prison routine. Yeah. Working in the kitchen. Yeah, I ended up working in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how long did you get sentenced for this time? Uh, it went a lot. Three and a half. Three and a half. Yeah, three and a half. Cause I never had a gun. And it was at Croydon Crown Court. Croydon Crown Court, yeah. They had more security than any previous trial. Yes. Oh, uh, is this, where did you see that? Well, we see, we get this information. Yeah, you do, yeah to they did, yeah. yeah. So we armed old Bill with everyone on the roofs, in, even standing next to the judge. Even standing, there was a cousin with a Eckler and Kosh standing next to the, and all his face all masked. I went, look at him. <laughs> yeah, they was all, all behind in where the public sit. They was all behind the public. They was everywhere. How does that make you feel to see they've gone to that extent? You, you think you're going to go away forever. Because you know, they're spending a, a lot of money. Believe, I couldn't believe it. Three and a half years. The others got um, fives, I think, or something like that. So, were there any situations during those prison years? Any riots or any people tried to kill you or anything? No, no one tried to kill me that time. Um, no, there's, there's just the usual prison tear ups, over, usually over food. It's usually over food, or someone wants to watch a football match and, and, it, and it goes off at ten past ten past nine, and the telly goes off at nine or something like that. And, oh, let's have a smash up. Well, I, I was always going for smashing up the nick, but <laughs> sometimes it was silly. Did anyone get killed around you this time? Like you talked about the guys. No, no, no one got breakfast. killed. No, a few people got stabbed, but they're always getting stabbed in prison. Aren't they? No, no one got killed this time. That bloke was just unlucky. Over a silly thing to die for a bowl of cornflakes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There was one in uh, in America um, where the guy, his cellmate didn't wake him up for his breakfast and ate his uh, his drank his juice and he, he strangled and stabbed him to death. Yeah, funny things that set you off in there. Yeah, <laughs> Robert. Well, you know you've been there, haven't you? So no one can tell you. Robert Wayne Vickers was the guy. If you want to Google it, he ended up getting the death penalty because he ended up killing a load of people after oh, that as he? well. Yeah, is he yeah. gone now? He was, he was classified as Arizona's most dangerous prisoner. Yeah. He was only on a short sentence when he killed his cellmate. And in the end, they said he was so dangerous. For the first time in the Arizona prison history, they put him in a cell and welded the door shut. 
because he was a, he was a master escape artist oh, as yeah. well. He get out of his handcuffs, get on the roof, and all kinds. Well, did his door shut? Well, did his door shut? They only opened it on one occasion to take him for the death penalty. Well, at least he got out for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that sentence went quite fast for you, then, did it? Well, as fast as they go. I mean, time time seems so quick out, of the, out here, and as you know, in there, the day seems like a week, doesn't it? How had prison changed from the first sentence to the second sentence? Food was better. What kind of food are we getting now? Well, still stews, but it had something in it, you know. <laughs> 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 it had a bit of meat in it and stuff like yeah. that, and uh, get sausages sometimes. Um, TVs? Uh, a TV on the wing, not in your cells. There used to be one on the wing, you had to watch it during the afternoon or from six o'clock onwards, you know what I mean, you could watch it. Could you buy items from the inmate store? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you buy your tobacco, uh, powdered milk, sugar, tea bags. People think it all comes from nothing, you still have, you have paper, as you know, still got to buy it. Did you have any preferred snacks from the store? Any snacks that you could buy? I used to like that, uh, like, a, like a fruit cake. it was, a Gino or something, Gino cake or something, I think it was called. Uh, oh, sorry, a Jaffa like fruit cake, was it? No, no, it wasn't Jaffa, no, no. It was like, it looked like a fruit cake. Yeah. You know what I mean? It had a funny name, I used to like that. But it's very expensive. <laughs> so, so during this second sentence, how old were you? That's no good asking me, that. Martin, how, how old during the second sentence? At 86. Um, 86 before you put here, 40. In his 40s. At, at this point in your life, Ron, were you reflecting on your behaviour or were you still part of you know you wanted to go back to it no, I, I, I don't think I know it had ever changed me hmm. from uh, doing what I'd done yeah I, 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 I didn't see no wrong in it to the truth mm -hmm. I mean they had it and I wanted it yeah you know I mean I didn't rob old ladies or sweet shops or someone's house or so you were committed to the lifestyle yeah I was yeah and when you got out did you go back to it Within, within a few days, yeah. And how did that feel to get back to it? Good. Felt good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a few quid in your pocket. Um, you I think I brought a jag as well, I think. You attended Ronnie Cray's funeral with Roy Shaw. He was a character, wasn't mm. he? Yeah. We uh, interviewed Gary Shaw, the son. And um, he, was, he was a very tough individual, Roy, wasn't he? Very tough. Do you have any stories of Roy? No, he used to just come over and dr and drink with us on a Friday and a Saturday, over over the over the, the club at Morden, over the top of the pub. There, there was a club. He used to come over there, he'd dip in his finger in it, and, and a bottle of vodka on the table. The governor used to bring him a bottle of vodka over, and sometimes he'd, he'd get nearly through the second bottle as well. He could half drink, but I think it was the speed really that was <laughs> getting him drinking. You know what I mean? It does make you feel. No, I felt right. Off. I mean, I was a friend of Joe's, so he was no threat to me. Did you see him in action? Yeah. You can any, fight. any stories you can talk about? No, not really. It weren't really a fight, really. He only hit the geezer twice, and he was out as. <laughs> <laughs> and you met Dave Courtney for the first time. R.I.P. Dave Courtney. He was one of our very first podcast guests. Was he? And he connected us with a lot of people. Yeah, he would yeah, do, Dave, he, yeah, he, was, yeah. he went out of his way for people. Yeah, he would do, Dave, yeah. 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 I spoke to him two days before he died. It was a shame. Yeah. Um, I met Dave. He was on the door of the church, and there was about 10, 12 of us, all the same firm, uh, walked up to the door, and he was standing there. And he said, sorry, mate, you can't come in. I went, I went yeah, we can. He went, no, you can't. I said, is Charlie Cray inside? He went, yeah. I went, go and tell him Ronnie Phil's waiting to come in. He went, come in. <laughs> so you know what I mean? I'd never knew who he was. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in we went. And there was a situation in Belmarsh Prison with Dave Courtney. We was having a bit of a tear up and uh, with the screws. And um, I got a bad heart and I went over with a heart attack. And uh, they they were still hitting me with their sticks and that. And um, Dave put himself on top of me to try and take a few of the blows and that. And he started trying to drag me to his cell. And that's, he probably saved me life, really. Wow. Because uh, 
he was he was shouting all the time. It runs out of and all the other kids in the cells were started kicking their doors and you know, you've heard what they what it sounds like, and you when it's going to go off, you must have heard it out there. The noises. Oh yeah, they're crashing and banging, and the screws are shitting themselves. Um, <laughs> scared. <laughs> Bodies and heads hitting walls and toilets <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that I mean that's a big deal, isn't it? To credit Dave with possibly saving your life. Yeah. You know, we, so, people perhaps may not have heard that story um, <clears throat> about about how he, he he possibly saved your life. That's that's. Really, it did save me life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. They would they would have left me there. Yeah. No, they just left me on the floor and, and locked everyone up and come back a couple of hours later or an hour later, you know what I mean? I mean, you got, you got to remember, these screws are, uh, are double A's, they're looking after double A's. You know, they're, they're not there because they're pussies, they're because they can have a vow. That's, that's why they're looking out, you know, that's why they're in there. And you were the first prisoner to arrive at Belmarsh, I think I that's was, where yeah. you got Julian Assange yeah, in there I was, right now. I was, um, there was an IRA escaped from Brixton unit and they shot their way out shot their way out yeah they shot their way out yeah okay. it's a story and uh, I don't know if it's true or not but uh, there was a story that the gun brought the, uh, a nun brought the gun in <laughs> in a trainer <laughs> yeah yeah tell me a story wow <laughs> so you arrive at Belmarsh what was it like uh, uh, Belmarsh was brand new wasn't it mm. I mean uh, all the walls were nice and clean. There was no poop up the walls. The toilets were all nice and clean. And trouble is, it was very lonely. <laughs> it was like a new generation of prison at that point. It was, yeah, yeah. Then um, Dennis and Mehmet, the Arifs, they all they all come the next day. But over the course of the week, the, the whole firm, the whole firm, their firm all come. They got done for a um, security van, Rygate. The week before us, we. We should have known because we was passing it every day. We should have given it a miss. <laughs> <laughs> and there's allegations of a prison governor being held hostage. No, uh, prevented from going to his place of work. <laughs> <laughs> he should he should have he should have done me for taking him hostage. But it, all he charged me with was uh, 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 stopping an officer going to his place of work. Is there a story behind that, Ron? That we can. Well, well it, was, it was just something that, that happened. Uh, one of the screws was an, an horrible, horrible bastard, and um, someone tipped a, a, a jug full of piss over him. Uh, he pulled his stick, and uh, it was off. <laughs> as soon as he pulled his stick, it, it was off. And uh, the governor come flying through, and um, I, I've copped hold of him, and uh, it, it was all scuffles going on everywhere, and he said, right, Right, that's en that's enough. I've had enough of this field, he said. That's enough now. I went, you're forgetting, Governor, I ain't let you go yet. <laughs> <laughs> he started giving orders and I still had hold of him, you know. <laughs> and, oh, about five years later, I've gone to another prison. It was, not, it was a good prison and all. And um, I got there, got settled in. And a week later, I went, oh, the Governor's about to die. I went, oh, I thought that was the Governor. But now the Governor's been away. Who was it? It was him. <laughs> I was only there two more days. I was back to Wandsworth. <laughs> oh. He didn't like me. <laughs> Can you explain to the viewers about Lenny McLean? Lenny? Uh, Lenny was, a, everyone knows, he was a man mountain. And uh, the old Bill fitted him up, tried to do him for murder, uh, killing the geezer. And... Uh, then he, then he, they brought I heard a helicopter come in, so I knew someone had turned up on a Sunday morning, it was. And uh, about half an hour later, the screw opened the door and he went, We've got a friend of yours downstairs. He said, Will you come and have a chat with him? So I said, Oh, is it Joe? He went, uh, You'll see when you, well, I want to, oh, so went, Who is it? He said, You'll see when you get down there. So I thought, I thought it's got to be someone I know. They wouldn't ask me to go and talk to you. When I got down there, then he was there and uh, they were scared of him. They were really, he was, have you ever met him? You must have met him. I've seen stuff online, I've not he met him. He's big, he's yeah. big, you know what I mean? So uh, I went, all right then. They opened the door, sort of half pushed me in. <laughs> and then he's sitting there, I said, you all right then? He went, he went oh, he said, I can't handle this one. I said, you're going to get a life then? I said, you've killed, you know, they're doing you for murder, you're going to be here for a long time. No, he said, I can't do it. I said, you've got to do it. Anyway, they, well, they opened the door and I said, uh, 
would you two like to have lunch together? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> lunch together? I went, yeah, yeah, very nice. So Lenny, Lenny said, what do I do? I said, well, just pick a tray up, walk along there, pick up what you want. So the, the first thing is a, tr a tray of meat. I mean, it's so thin you can see through it. So he, he's trying, I went, take the lot. He went, well, I, went, I won't say nothing to you. He took the lot, so I picked up a, a big tray of spuds. I went on with him. <laughs> <laughs> we went back in his cell and ate the lot. <laughs> they, had to, they had to send over for more gear. <laughs> yeah, I said, they won't say nothing to you, Len. They were terrified of him. Sounds like him and Roy Shaw, larger than life, both of them. Yeah. When when Little Joe's in, um, I think it was Little Joe's birthday or engagement party, they both turned up at, at the club. Both of them. And, and Joe said to me, we've got a bit of a situation here, Ron. I went, yeah? He went, yeah. He said, uh, them two, they don't like each other. I know that. Really? He, said, he, said, he said, keep them apart. I went, I'm not going to keep them apart. <laughs> He said, no, keep an eye on them. Don't let them start on everything. Yeah. Oh, he's winding me up here. He's got a <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would have liked to have seen it if they had. Definitely. So, on, upon release, you palled up with Charlie Cray and you had some good times out on the town. Mm -hmm. What was the story that happened at Annabelle's club and Princess Diana? Oh, yeah, we pulled up at Anna, Annabelle's and um, it's got out of cars and it and uh, geezer's gone to park the car up and uh, the manager says Charlie I'm really sorry he said you, you can't come in tonight so Charlie what was that in because he, he was a proper gentleman Charlie he said oh he said oh, oh princess dies in and he went I don't mind <laughs> <laughs> you imagine the press couldn't you because he'd have gone over and said hello to her so, you know, the, the cameras would have snapped that up wouldn't they yeah <laughs> so he, he sent he, he, they called a limo round and, and we went coming on their expenses. <laughs> Stringfellow. Was the story behind Peter Stringfellow? Well, only, only that he tried to fob us off with cheap champ because we, we never used to pay for nothing. I know it sounds terrible. There's people, they, they give it to you. <laughs> and he, he come over with his champagne and um, we were sitting there and Joe, Joe looked at it and he went, now come on, Peter. He said, you know we don't drink that. <laughs> it was some Moe, I say. Uh, we wanted Crystal, yeah. <laughs> Crystal, I say, like that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the only story with Peter. So I'm banned from America for life. So am I. <laughs> that's, that was what I was getting at. What, you actually tried to get in, didn't you? I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. What was that about? Where, where were you going to meet? We were going to meet some um, American friends of Joe's. One of the families? Yeah. Uh, we didn't get there. <laughs> yeah we didn't get there so the, one of them ended up coming over here and seeing Joe and it but yeah they didn't let us didn't let us get on the plane <laughs> yeah we've done a lot of work with Michael Francis have you? yeah yeah, yeah and he's uh, gigging in London later this month you, you guys should come along we'll we'll hook that up if, you, if you're interested yeah, yeah I'd like that yeah. Yeah. yeah I'd like that yeah and if the viewers are watching um, tickets are on Eventbrite for that one so, you did a f invited to a fundraiser for Charlie Cray's son, introduced uh, by Charlie to some faces from up north. Yeah, Scousers. Yeah, old Bill they were. Old Bill. They were old Bill. Yeah. What? They're the ones who put us away. Oh no. Yeah, we was all having a having a drink, and Ch Charlie said, "Come, come and say hello to a couple of mates of mine from up north." Yeah. So you we know, shook hands, had a chat, and that very well dressed they were. Yeah except for the Dr. Martins, and um, started drinking and that, and then they, they said, oh, you must come up, have a drink with us, up in Manchester, so, said, yeah, 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 you know you do, yeah, of course you will, that. about five weeks later, four weeks later, Charlie phoned me up, he said, um, do you fancy a trip up Manchester, so I said, uh, not really, Charlie, he went, but they said, Newcastle, Newcastle, yeah, so I always get him mixed up, they're both up there, and I. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and um, I forgot what it was now. So Charlie Cray's getting set up in New. Yeah, they were setting him up, but of course they set me up and all. Charlie never had no cocaine. It was just a, a, a total fit up, wasn't it? Was it? A total fit up. Yeah. In fact, two two kilo two kilo of cocaine I got actually come from an old bill. I find out. You know? mm. <laughs> Is that because he was such a big name? 
They is would, that, is they, that what, they, is they, that what they, motivated them? They would at the end of the craze. I mean, Charlie weren't a, Charlie weren't a gangster. Yeah. He, he, you know, he, was, he was just a gentleman, really. And he got sent down for a while, didn't he, because of that case? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He died in there from that case. And were you sent down on that case? Yeah. yeah. And what sentence did you get? Nine, I think. Nine. And did you feel resentful because of you, you weren't in, I, involved? I, I, I felt a bit upset with Charlie because he lied to me. Mm. He didn't tell me. He, he told me. I said, who are these people, Charlie? And he said, oh, he, don't worry. He said, they're good. I've known them ages. He hadn't. He'd only known them a year. So he vouched for them? He vouched for me, yeah, and I stood for it. But see, Char Charlie was always skinny. And, and, uh, so I don't really blame him, you know what I mean? I mean, I like Charlie. And, and the cops, they were acting... Like they were taking the drugs. Oh yeah, they were taking. They it. were getting sex workers. One, all one this of stuff. them. One of them. We couldn't keep my wife from the brasses. But the case, they still won the case. Yeah, of course they won the case. They're old Bill, weren't they? <laughs> and then um, you sourced a token amount of the white powder, and the plan was to do a small deal, and back out of anything big. We weren't going to know do a deal at all, really. Charlie just wanted to get a deposit off of you know. 80, 100 grand or something. But that puts you in a conspiracy then? Yeah. Mm. Where were you when they came for you? And uh, just give them the gear. And they give me a case of money. Uh, we walked outside and it was on us. Mm. As it does, you know what I mean? <laughs> How did that feel on that occasion? Gutted. Gutted? Yeah, a big sex, a case full of money. <laughs> mm. I'm not going to spend none of it. So you argued that the whole thing was sanctioned to bring the craze down. Yeah. As the Kemp, the Kemp Brothers film, I remember that film. The what film? The, the snake and everything in the film. Oh, the yeah, Kemp yeah. The Kemp Brothers. Yeah, yeah, That's terrible um, film, wasn't it? And that, that had <laughs> revised the craze legend. Yeah, it did, yeah. It did, yeah. And that came out shortly before The Sting. Charlie appeared on the Frank Skinner TV show. He did, didn't he? Yeah. 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 So Frankie Fraser and Dave Courtney appeared as character witnesses at the trial. Oh, no, it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, who, who could ever think of that? <laughs> How did that go down? Yeah, it didn't go down very well with the judge, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, no. And Frank told the judge that he was more likely to sell drugs than, <laughs> than Charlie. The judge didn't like that. During this sentence, did you reflect and decide you'd had enough? I suppose, in a way, I did. Uh, if something nice would have come up, of course, I'd have gone for it. But yeah. I, I wasn't going out looking for looking for anything anymore. You know, usually you drive around, don't you, on a Friday, see what's being delivered <laughs> where. Well, I do, you don't. <laughs> 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 we used to drive around and see what, what, what bank was getting what deliveries, what time, whether it's the same time next week, the week after, and it. Because funny thing with banks, you know, they get all that money come over the counter, all helmets on and chains and god knows what then they put it on the floor behind the counter for about an hour <laughs> all you've got to do is get behind the jump and you got it <laughs> was it just the money ron or was it the excitement excitement well i think it was both i did enjoy it i've got to be honest i did enjoy it but i enjoyed it and i'm not spending it <laughs> i really did i mean when you got into a job and you're getting it done how high is the adrenaline I never thought of it like that. I, just, I suppose it must have been away, really away, but I, I, I wasn't one of them geezers who, uh, you know, I, I was there for the money. Once I got the money, then I want to go home. And were you c calm and cool and trained? Yeah, keep, yeah. never keep take drugs. Kept, level, kept level headed yeah, never during the jobs. Drugs. We'd never take drugs. Well, I still don't take drugs. What if someone tried to do a job with you who did take drugs? Oh, they did. Or you felt. We, 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 one gate, I was seeing pop a pill mm. I said what's that he said, it's only a bit of speed I said to my mate pull up he's pulled out he said what's that I said out you go I said you're not coming with us he could shoot someone for nothing couldn't he yeah be a liability you know what I mean he, he might even shoot me <laughs> what what other things were on your checklist that would make you stop doing a job with somebody or stop doing a job completely if, if it didn't look right if there was too many post office vans or gas ball vans or milk floats about, yep. that sort of thing, you know what I mean? Did well, you ever have any superstitions? Green cars. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, a couple of my mates got killed in green cars really? by the old bills. So I wouldn't go to work in a green car. 
Um, the stories of the green cars, are you able to talk about them or is that something off no, limits? No, we'll leave that, I think. We'll leave that. Yeah. All right, so you get out then from the sentence with Charlie Cray. What was it like when you got released? What was the world like? Uh, it didn't say, well, I hadn't been away long at all. What, four and a half years? Did you do yeah. half of it? Uh, yeah, I think I did, no, a bit more than half of it. A bit more, about five years. Yes, no, I didn't do, do, didn't do five. I, four and a bit, I think, something like that. Yeah. But it's nothing it really changed, did it? You know, I mean, mm. it, it was just the same. It's like the nineties, now, man. Yeah. Now, two thousand and one, you did. Charles did it a couple of years later. You, you got two thousand and one. Why didn't you go back to crime? I thought I did. <laughs> 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 I didn't get caught no more. Yes. In, in the narrative of the book, he, oh, when he comes out the last time, he's decided enough. It's enough. Yeah, enough. Got, enough. Yeah. yeah, enough was enough. Got, yeah. yeah, yeah, enough was oh, enough. Oh, the, the very last time, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the very last time, yeah. yeah. And what, what, could you just expand on the decision-making process? Because to, to, to be in the lifestyle for decades, that's a big decision to make to come out of it. Some people never come out of it. What, what was going on in your head? Well, I'd, I'd had a couple of heart attacks. Uh, they nearly let me die once. I didn't want to die in prison because of my daughter and that, you know what I mean? When you said they nearly let you die, what well, when was Dave, when Dave saved me. When Dave saved you, that yeah, was that one. They nearly let me yeah. die there. Uh, they left me in a corridor once I had an heart attack. They just left me in the corridor where they went off to get someone, the hospital doctor or something, yeah. wherever they're supposed to be. And um, <clears throat> they forgot all about me. <laughs> I'm still there two hours later. So, so would you say that health reasons was a big reason in your decision? My daughter, I think. Family? Family, yeah, family, yeah. yeah. And your daughter, did she ever have any conversations with you about all these incarcerations? Yeah, she didn't think it was a very good idea. Yeah. And how did that affect you in the heart? Uh, well, let her down, I know, really. You know what I mean? So you credit her with motivating you to stop? Yes, I think I do, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And once you stopped, and she saw you'd stopped, did you then have a, a you know a stronger relationship with your daughter? Uh, we've always had a strong relationship. Um, it, it did seem a bit better than that, you know. I mean, I mean we, she was always worried that she's going to, like she did when I got nicked with Charlie. She turned the radio on, and there it was. We was all over the radio, and then the telly turned the telly on. We was all over the telly about getting nicked. And you became. Uh, technical advisor for Charles Bronson on the film with Tom Hardy. I was going to be, yeah. You was going to be? I was going to be, but me and Charlie had words. So how did your relationship with Charlie begin? Uh, Parkhurst, I think. Yeah, Parkhurst, yeah. And was he a force of nature in the prison system? Yes, he could have a row, Charlie, no doubt about it. He wasn't scared of no one. But uh, Did you ever see him in action? Well, not really. Now I see him clump a few people, but not really, uh, not toe to toe with anyone. You know what I mean? Yeah, just a few yeah. quick knockouts. Yeah, you only get him once. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's powerful. <laughs> he is powerful. Oh, yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah, I, it's a shame we 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 parted friend parted uh, not friends over something silly. You know what I mean? But he, uh, he asked me if I'd be technical advisor on the film, and I said yeah, and it was going on all right. You know what I mean? little things, I uh, do this, do that. But in the end, he, he just started to boss me about. You know what I mean? And I, went out, I couldn't have that. So in 2007, Joey Powell's funeral, I mean, you spent so many years of your life with him. How did that affect you? I was very upset. I, was, I already did when he died. You was, you was with him? Yeah, I was with him when he died, yeah. Are, are you okay to talk about the circumstances of that? Sorry? Are you okay to talk about that day? Well, that, that day, I went up there like I did every day and um, was in there and the doctor said, you know, he's, he's not doing too good. He's, uh, then his brother Ted come and, he, and he's uh, Ted's wife. Uh, and then little Joe come and, and little Joe went in. I left little Joe with, with um, big Joe for a little while. Uh, and Joe said, come in. Little Joe, big Joe wasn't, wasn't conscious. So I went in and I was standing there and I was holding his hand and little Joe was this side of the bed, sort of holding his hand and 
quite up, were very upset, you know. And he just went in. And I phoned my mate up and uh, they were there and uh, I said he'd gone because he was coming up to see him, you know what I mean? Was it something that had been anticipated for a bit? Or was it oh, unexpected? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I come out of there, I, 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 my way of uh, dealing with grief is, is uh, use, well, used to be um, violence. And we just come out of there and we're just turning out of the hospice into the main road and the old bill swooped on us and I said to him you know, oh, I can't swear can I can't you ever leave us alone I said my mate's just died and you still want to fucking be like that. they went oh sorry didn't know Joe had died and they drove away and left us oh that's good at <laughs> yeah. least yeah unbelievable yeah and how did it feel to be the pole burrow well it was an honour really it was an honour yeah it was there was me Fred, Ronnie, um, Ronnie Nash, um, Ronnie Nash, can't think of who else it was now. Joe, Joe Junior. Oh, yeah. little Joe Junior, of course, and, and the other one who can have a right ruck, I can't think of his name now. Roy. Roy, yeah, Roy, yeah, Roy Shaw, yeah. Roy and just Shaw. for the, just for the viewers. And then you... we changed over. Well, I didn't change, but some of the others stepped down and let someone else take their place off. Uh, a Freddie Foreman's boy, you know, the actor, he stood in for a little while and different people stood in to carry the coffin, you know, but I, I stayed where I was. Me and Fred stayed. And just to, for the viewers, uh, Joey Powell Jr., we have had him on the podcast. Uh, if you go back over the back catalogue, you can check the story out. It's, it's incredible. So after the funeral, what was your life like? Um, bit lost really was you? bit lost yeah a bit lost really but uh, as you, uh, you know, everything has to uh, come to an end doesn't it uh, it was the end of a era because that was your family that was like your family wasn't it yeah it was really yeah yeah after everything you went through as a yeah, young person yeah we all went through things together you know i mean yeah. prison together we were in prison together for a long time uh yeah, it, it was sort of an end of an era then yeah, i was a bit lost for a little while uh, that's how it, that's how, well, that's how it goes, isn't it? You know? And what was the motivation to do the book? Uh, my mate there, it was his idea. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Are we allowed to say? That yeah, your name, yeah, your say name. His name. It was Del's idea. It was Del's idea. Yeah, Del's yeah. idea. Yeah. I just got to move a minute. Yeah, go for it. We're only got a few, only got a few minutes left. Uh, my back's killing me. Yeah. Yeah, Del Del said about making a book and. Martin was down the club, down our club, and uh, he, he thought he, he, heard, he heard some stories. Now, I was telling someone, you know, you tell me stories, don't you? Some travellers come down, they were friends of ours, and they were talking about this, and the other. Martin heard it and thought it made a good book. There's nothing in that book that's not true. Every single piece is true. Yes, and the link from the Furious is in the description box below this video. It's available on Amazon. Uh, check it out. Writing the book, then working on the book. How did that feel? Because did it did it bring up memories? Childhood. Yeah, I didn't like talking about my childhood. I never talked about it before. Yeah. I, I talked to Martin about it, and uh, I think he respected it. You know what I mean? I, I mm -hmm. didn't go into it as much as I could have done. There were some things that I didn't mention. You know what I mean? <clears throat> some things you want to try and keep at the back of your mind, or you know, don't want them coming forward at the time. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and working on the book, did it give you like, you know, like you've put this lifestyle behind you, but now you're kind of like reflecting on it and using it as a career kind of move. It was a good G, <laughs> 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 uh, and and Martin done it perfect. Ma Ma Martin, well, I think me and Martin have become good friends now, and uh, yeah, he uh, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, and he never ever pushed me for any answers that he knew I didn't really want to give about anything or anybody. And why should people buy the book, Ron? Um, if you want to tell the viewers, why should they buy the book? So I can buy a new car. <laughs> 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 no, it, it, it's it's uh, all joking aside. It's it's <laughs> it's a story of a life of a lifetime spent. That it's never going to come again these times ain't never going to come again and I hope, I hope the poverty never comes again either from my early years I hope, I hope no one ever has to go through that again 
Is there anything you'd like to say to the viewers in conclusion who've sat here for almost two hours listening we, to your story today? Is there any, any, anything you'd like to say to them? Or any, any stories you've, you've missed out or anything? No, it's just if, if, if you're a youngster, this game ain't no good. You, you want to give it a miss. It's, uh, it ruins your family. It makes you look good at the time, and you are good at the time, but you lose all your friends. You, the, the, uh, the friends you've got are really close ones, and the other friends are passing in the night, you know what I mean? So don't get gangsteritis, folks. Keep your day jobs. <laughs> um, we, we're deeply honoured. Like I said at the very beginning, there's not many people from your generation left to tell these stories. It's, it's a unique thing that you've captured there in your book. And I hope people read the book. There's a lot more detail, a lot more stories in the book. And we are greatly honoured that you've come here. Yes, and honour for you to ask and, us. And share, and share the story with us. So huge, huge thank you, my friend. Yeah, cheers. Cheers, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Well oh. done. If you're looking for a gift, my new book, Sit Downs with Gangsters, is available worldwide on Amazon. We've interviewed over a 1,000 people now, and we selected 10 of the hardest-hitting stories to go in this book. Each chapter features the story of one of our podcast guests. Those stories are Shane Taylor, Knife Maniac's Redemption, John Elite, Mafia Hitman for the Gambino crime family, Joey Barnett, 35 years in UK prison, Ian Blink MacDonald, £6 million bank robber, Chet Sandu, Asian smuggler in Spanish Supermax, John Lawson, the hit team commander, David Macmillan, international smuggler's Thai death row prison escape, John Abbott, San Quentin prison shootout and escape, Michael Francis, Colombo crime family capo portrayed in Goodfellas. And Wildman, English enforcer in Arizona prison. Link in description box on YouTube, available worldwide on Amazon. Also, my next book, Untouchable Jimmy Savile, is getting published in December 2023. So check that out as well. It will be available worldwide on Amazon. Thank you for listening. Cheers.